Once again, good evening. I'm glad you could all make it. My name is Devin Halverson. I'm, as she said before, I am your MC for the night. So I would ask you now at this time to take out your cell phones and turn them off. I'll leave them there the rest of the night. Tonight we will have a presentation on the history of the Navajo by Sean, Carolina, and Jonathan from Professor King's history class, after which we will be honored to hear from Albert Smith. At the conclusion of his remarks, he has agreed to answer questions, so be thinking of those now. So you can be ready. We will now be privileged to hear the history of the Navajo from Sean, Carolina, and Jonathan. served as a U.S. Marine during World War II, providing false information about his age at the time to meet the requirements to join the military. <laughs> he was selected to train the Navajo Court Talkers. He served in the 4th, 14th, and 23rd Marine Division. He faced combat and worked in the military code operations at the Marshall Islands, Saipei, Tainan, and Iwo Jima. Smith returned to Navajo lands after his service in World War II, and he married in September 1953. He traveled abroad and gained for the U.S. military to Korea and left right before conflict broke out in Korean War. Smith continued to finish his education and become a teacher for the American Indian students and worked in Oregon for some time before returning to the New Mexico to settle in Guadalupe with his wife and their daughter. Gallup, sorry. He had been president of the Navajo Code Talkers Association and he served in other capacities in the association. He has traveled extensively to speak publicly about his experiences as Navajo Code Talker after the code was satisfied, sorry, after the code was classified in 1968. He, he, he had participated in the making of the documentaries and the written of monograph, monographs sorry, concerning the history of the Navajo Code Talkers. He was also selected as a technical advi advi sorry, advisor for the film Wind Talkers, directed by John Woo in 2002. At the age of 86, soon to be 87 in December, Smith continues to share his knowledge and experience with communities throughout the country, and he has graced Utah Valley University with his presence and willingness to speak publicly about a trying but impressive time in his life. In an S estimate from November 2010, uh, 2010 sorry, fewer than 100 of the 400 Navajos trained as co-talkers by the military are alive today. Only one of the original 29 Navajo co-talkers who worked on the division the code is currently alive. Chester Ness, who recently collaborated with Judith Avila to publish his memoir in September 2011, entitled Code talker the first and only memoir by the original Navajo co-talkers of World War II. Sean, do you want to share? There he is. Okay. And then my other student, Sean, will talk about some of the research our class their students have been doing. term used to describe people who talked using a coded language from the Navajo. All the code talkers were Native Americans from the Navajo tribe, ranging in numbers around 400, but I think it was actually 420 to be precise. Um, Navajo code talkers took part in every assault in the U.S. Marines conducted in the Pacific Theater in 1942 to 1945. 
Um, it was the only unbreakable code in modern military. When a Navajo code talker received a message, it was in a string of unrelated Navajo words, and those words were represented by the English phonetic alphabet. Code talkers first had to translate each Navajo word into its English equivalent. Then the code talker used the first letter of the English equivalent in spelling each of the words. Uh, most letters had uh, uh, most letters had more than one Navajo word representing them. Not all words had to be spelled out letter by letter, though. The developers of the original code assigned Navajo words to represent about 450 frequently used military terms that did not exist in the Navajo language, which kind of made for a code within a code. Um, we have some examples. I'm sure I will not pronounce them right. Um, uh, Beshlo, is that correct? Beshlo. Beshlo, there you go. Uh, means iron fish, which uh, was signifying a submarine. Uh, Dahatiki uh, was hummingbird, meant a uh, fighter plane. Ooh, I'm not going to do this one. Debelizine was black street, which meant squad. So you can kind of see how uh, it would translate twice within the languages. A um, little history on the Navajo. The ancestors lived in the northwestern Canada, northwestern Canada and Alaska over a thousand years ago, and they began to travel south and reach the southwestern United States. The Navajo were hunters and gatherers until the culture was influenced by the Pueblo Indians. Uh, the beginning of the English, Spanish, and French colonization in the northern Americas uh, pushed the many Native American tribes, including the Navajo people, off their land by any means necessary. In January of 1864, the Navajo people were forcibly let out of their ancestral home in the Amer Arizona and Western New Mexico Territory to Fort Sumner by the United States government. The journey was 450 miles long, lasted 18 days, and 200 Navajo died. Uh, why a Navajo code? Uh, communication was essential in World, World War II. Uh, the codes that the Allies were using were being decrypted by the opposing decrypted by the imposing forces, eliminating the element of surprise and in many circumstances being used against the Allied forces. In 1942, a man named Philip Johnston thought of a code he thought unbreakable by the enemy, a code based on the Navajo language, which was a non-dominant language and very difficult to learn. Uh, once the code was created, the Navajo recruits were tested and retested. There could be no mistakes in any of the translations. One mistranslated word could lead to the death of thousands of men. One of the first 29 were, oh, once the first 30 were trained, two remained behind to become instructors, and I think, did they drop out? Yeah, and one dropped out for me. Um, the program was such a success that the Marine Corps authorized unlimited recruiting for the Navajo program. Uh, training wasn't easy though. They had to memorize lots of information and be fluent in communicating and translating the code. The importance of the code and talkers in the war was that they were able to talk freely over the radio and still have the element of surprise on the enemy. Having the ability to keep messages played an important role in the final result of either winning or losing many battles. It was the difference between saving lives or losing lives. Code talkers were important to the war effort because of uh, the existence and dangerous things they needed to do. They had to take English messages verbally without writing anything down and then translate them. The American Indian code talkers also had to become educated with radio systems. Uh, during the war, the Navajo code talkers were strictly classified information for the fear that the code would be broken. The public knowledge of the Navajo Code Talkers and their service to the United States were unknown until the 1960s. Despite the late, well-deserved recognition, the Code Talkers were revered as heroes and victors of the war for their contributions. Even today, their past services to the United States are being honored by cities, states, government officials, and military personnel, including present soldiers. And that's all I have. Thank you. Yet a verina king yinishe, Vilagana nishle, kiyaani bashis chin. Hi, um, my name is Farina King. I'm, my mother is Anglo white, and I was born for the tall, towering house clan. 
of my father's side, who is um, from Diné the Navajo land. And um, my father is uh, the youngest of about 11 children. And Albert Smith is one of his big older brothers who served in World War II. He had um, a couple other brothers who also served in the war. One of them named George Smith also was trained as a Navajo code talker as well. Um, I've, ever since I was a little girl, I loved hearing and meeting with my uncles, sorry, <laughs> and hearing them share their experiences with me about my heritage and my ancestry and their sacrifices. Sorry. So I, since then, since I was a teenager and was able to really spend time with them and, and learn of this very um, rich history and unique source that I was able to have in my family, I wanted to share that. And um, so I, I had my students, I have a, about 140 students in my class of history, um, 1700 American civilization. and. We worked together as a team in bringing my uncle from New Mexico to come here to Utah Valley University to speak and to a public lecture. And I really couldn't have done it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm such an emotional person. Um, I really couldn't have done it without the support of my students <laughs> who um, were able to gain the attention of our Dean, David Yells, who helped to fund this, um, this lecture and the events that we are able to have today. Many rich events of him speaking in my class and to another class and um, meeting with the president of the university and sharing with him his experiences too, which I hope would even um, influence the, the president of this university and, and how he runs this school and education. And Albert has a history of being an educator himself. Um, so we are so grateful to have him here. And I always enjoy any opportunity to hear him. And so I'm glad you guys can share this um, occasion with us. And now, finally, to the one you have come to hear, Albert Smith. That is, to call my attention to our spiritual father so that you, you can hear me and have him help you to understand it more clearly. Thank you. I'm sorry to be late. The code that I used never was used late during the combat fields. So a little age hasn't done quite a bit of that either. <laughs> the, the report that you heard is just a little too steep for me at the moment, but I have myself. To clearly override it. <clears throat> Thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, students. I'm beginning to be a family of Solomon City. I used to travel here during the making of the freeway. And now I don't think I'd find my way across Salt Lake City. I used to live in Oregon, 
So I used to drive every now and just about every year or so on vacation. A couple of times, the freeway led me into the mountains. But a mountain, ladies and gentlemen, is a church where you can go talk to your spiritual father. And we have four of them at home. One for morning, one for noon, one for evening, and one for late traveling. That is if you care to. So you have the mountains all around you. And from what I have seen since my travel across Salt Lake City, you have a beautiful place. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what us veterans make us happy. All the hard work, all the enemy faces we have seen, that takes care of it. So thank you. It's appreciated for keeping everything going. I've noticed some of the streets are thinning, so it's being worked on, which is very encouraging too. And your campus, very encouraging. I've been on it so many times. That's why I think sometimes I went to school here too. <laughs> and thank you. The Cold Talker, ladies and gentlemen, came about when the Americans, without thinking, gave the Japanese the Morse code when they were students in the United States. So when they fought them, they couldn't stop them. In one year's time, the Japanese occupied all the major islands in the Pacific, from Japan to Alaska to Australia. It took them that long. They were bombing Australia when the Cold Talker came into use in Guadalcanal. The code was made on the basis of the military language. So that when an officer wanted to know something, wanted assistance in every possible fighting unit. Equipment, <coughs> food, health-wise, recovery of wounded men, <coughs> lost men in the ocean, down plains, all the need that was necessary to use the code so the enemy would not know what was being planned against them. So we went from island to island using the code. The code was made so that we could send the message to any place where the fighting unit was. An officer, our commanding officer would write the message, whatever was needed. 
And all we did was read the message as it is. No decoding. We decoded up here. Changed the English language to Navajo language. And we heard various kinds of odd information about what the Japanese thought about us. They were, I guess sometimes they thought we were out of the woods. Either I, that or out hunting for something else. And so, even though it was difficult, the fighting, because the enemy, we did not know, really what kind of a person they were. So we have to learn from the beginning all the way to the end. When they, at that time, the enemy, when he was, became, when he became a serviceman, that was it, that was his life. You couldn't take him alive. He fought, he fought you until he was dead. That was the kind of enemy we had. But after we finished, some of those captured all the way from uh, Water Canal, there weren't very many at the beginning, but gradually the captured enemy increased until from China, many of them came back. I worked with some of them while I was in Japan. They didn't know I was one of the enemy. <laughs> And while I was on my special duty to, uh, to record some of the past history, about, I went back about four times to do that, to recover some of the uh, expenditures. And one I met on Okinawa, an enemy. We had breakfast together. When we were finished with the breakfast, he asked me where I had been. And I told him some of those places. I even uh, <clears throat> wound up telling him I was on Iwo Jima. I was looking at him through my eyebrows because it shook him. He didn't know how to take me. He didn't want to shake hands with me. He was shivering, but he did. Yes. That's the enemy that came back to his homeland after he had given it up before while he was joining the services. See, they had given up their family, they have given up their tradition, they have given up their country to be in the military service. That's why they had to fight to the end. So now I imagine that those that came back during the uh, Korean War, during some of those uh, other uh, <coughs> Oriental country uh, fighting, is their home now, 
I don't know how they're living in Japan. Maybe they were taken back by their family, I don't know. But if they became sensible, then they are good Japanese now. And I have an interesting story to tell you. Remember this. One Japanese came across the Pacific Ocean, landed in Los Angeles, hitchhiking, and met with the uh, news media in Los Angeles. He didn't tell us this, but some of the details that he was working on told me that. Because he came to riding, catching a ride across the country, he met a Navajo Kung Talker. I don't know how, but accidentally he did that. And they became friends. So whenever we had a special events going on in Gallup, he would bring him, introduce him to us, and he was a photographer. <coughs> what he had done in Los Angeles was, at the news media, he set up plans. He had a, a general idea where he wanted to get some information and how. So he had met with the news media for photographers, for news gathering items. About three special reporting people. The first time they came to interview us, to visit the community, to visit the general area of his visit, during the uh, Lions Club Rodeo. The next time, the 4th of July. Every time there was a three or four different people coming to Gallup from LA to pick up additional information. Next, during the ceremonial, they were learning everything about us, who we were, what we were, how we were raised, our background and everything else, and the people that we live with, our families. <clears throat> After the ceremonial came the tribal fair. There were some more at the tribal fair, gathering information, visiting people, observing, even eating some of the food that we ate. And our last visit to us to uh, the uh, last October uh, gathering in Shiprock. That's when they have their first winter dance. They came with special cameras because they wouldn't let them uh, take the uh, winter songs, traditional winter songs. So what they did, they moved beyond the hills. They had special equipment. They just turned on the they were receiving equipment from behind the hills. We knew that because when they were showing the film, accidentally we heard the songs in the background. After they were finished with that, they took one of the Navajo co who has a daughter 
Uh, Head Start teacher. And he made a special arrangements for the school, for the students, the Head Start students, the court talker, and the teacher made a special trip to accompany the information they had gathered. Made a tour of the total Japan to give them the information who the Navajo cool talkers were, where they came from, what they ate, and everything else. He stayed around, the individual stayed around town. Oh, the book that he uh, put the pictures into was Navajo Warriors. That was the title. So if you have a chance, oh, by the way, how many of you saw Wind Talker? There's some uh, Hollywood stuff in there. <laughs> After he made the uh, European, the, uh, the Japanese trip, he came back and then he had an intention of learning something about Europe. So he made a tour with the, uh, the natives. Does natives go to Europe and make a tour for introduction to the German people and some of the European other people? So he accompanied them, and that was part of the payment that, that he obtained from his books. He tried to uh, enlist in the Air Force when his wife, he wanted to go with his wife to, into the Air Force. They wouldn't let him because he's still a nationalist and he wanted to stay on a military base. They told him no. So he lived with his in-laws in Window Rock. He's quite a, a changed man from what he was. He was very quiet, but now you can Stay away from him, and he won't stay away from you. <laughs> Those are some of the things that can work into you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I imagine some of you are wondering, how many co-talkers there are around yet. There is not too many of us, but we're sort of scattered out now. We're here and there, very few of us. We're sort of fading away, one, two, three at a time, because of our health, because of our minds and because of our failing bodies. It is, it is quite interesting, quite helpful that we able that we were able to help Americans to still be a powerful nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I know many of you are not too set on our liberty. You're not too set on our sovereignty, and you are not quite aware of our Constitution.
that is very serious, Americans, very serious. You know where, how, and why? We have been so free. We have been so powerful. Spiritually and reserve wise. Reserve our medical health, our social health, and the beautiful schools that you have around here. And on top of that, We don't know what is going on in Washington, D.C. Because Obama has cut you off. He doesn't want you to know actually what is going on in here. Some time ago, I was talking to my elders back home. I said, I'm sorry, you were misled when you made an election. You weren't thinking about it. You didn't think deep enough. You were blindfolded and you woke for a man And ladies, I said, ladies and gentlemen, you are about ready to go back to the G-strings. You know what I mean by that? That's how us Indians used to travel, very lightly, with a, it was just a G-string. <laughs> Yes, we can make that into a laughing matter, but deeply thinking, that is where we are, American. You have elected an individual who wants you, not the way you are, not the way you are, having your constitution, your freedom of speech, your health wise, your forward looking, adventurous. You're ready for that type of a lonely, begging, begging Americans because He's getting money from China every time he wants some money for his assistance. He's paying your congressmen to vote for money. He's selling your senators He took most of our money. Those of us that have earned it. Social Security money. It's about ready to collapse. You know what he's doing? Blind foreign Americans you know what I call Obama? Those of you that travel, those of you that travel across the reservation, across the mountains, 
He's like a coyote. When he talks to you, he's singing his war calls. Calling his helpers for more money so that he can give to the world lonely people. That's how he's giving you money. And he's cleaning out your back pocket. So that is, I'm not looking at the back door of some of the leaders. I'm working with the Justice Department from home without the green stuff. How? I'm one of the circle leaders. So every time somebody wants some extra money, they're cleaning out my back pocket. <clears throat> That's why I'm here. Not looking at your pocket, but letting you know what our country is getting into. We're not working together, Americans. We're not thinking together. We're very quiet. We're very generous. And freedom is slipping out of our hands. The Constitution is no longer in use by the senators. They don't even work over with Obama. All they're looking for is money. When he gives out his general order, he doesn't care about Constitution. He doesn't care about his oath of office. He never goes back to that. So, I don't know if my post office box can even hold the mail that I receive. So according to that, I am out sometimes. One night, somebody was on my door with a special key. I was still up working on some Washington papers. I saw, I heard a click. One door, one lock came undone. A few minutes later, I saw, I heard another click, my second door. And I was waiting for the individual to come in, but it didn't come in. So I had to put, relock the door, put a couple of chairs in front of it, so the chairs would wake me up. So be careful. As I understand, ladies and gentlemen, the weather that you're having now is a weather for 12 months. Because of the planets, the moons, the stars, they're readjusting themselves. So it's not just the American people that are not wide awake. Just like it happened in Japan, the earthquake, hurricane, and we had some uh, foul weather in the Pacific Ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean. 
those are also the result of the 12-month disturbance, earthquakes. So <clears throat> if you have a lot of uh, volcanoes, be careful. They might be waking up too. And you know why that's happening? They said some of us Americans and I guess the rest of the world don't have any spiritual outlook. Some of them don't even care about the next day. They just have one day at a time. So those things are disturbing all the way up. Twelve planets. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm still struggling other than being a warrior. And it's good to talk to you. I don't want you to be scared. I want you to think about it more than just tomorrow. To look beyond it. You're still the spirit of the child. That is your strength. So continue your outlook and beyond. I talk like this because many of you carry it. Many of you call me grandpa because of this one. <laughs> Thank you for. This becomes my friend in for a long time. <laughs> I have to talk a little loud. Sometimes I can't, I can't hear myself. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your evening. I also pray for you. I talk to my spiritual father. I carry many things. Sometimes I could hear the various bombs, the various shells approaching me. Then sometimes land over on this side, or on that side, shakes up a little dust, but no ice cream or no special pudding. It just goes out. Because I used to travel that night too. Not as a werewolf, but <laughs> but deliver important messages for the next day operation. Because I walk very slowly, very softly. My wife used to call me, she said. When you get home, please don't just walk in, knock on the door and tell me I'm coming in. So I used to sing, I'm coming, I'm coming. Questions? Anybody? You know, I don't think this. 
Uh, did you go through a Green Corps boot camp before you became a code talker? I, I was under the impression that the code talkers went straight to their, their training and they didn't really have to go through the same boot camp that the rest of the Corps had. I don't think a Marine sergeant would have approved of that. <laughs> bypassing the very important portion of the introduction. Well, we went to the Marine Corps boot camp in San Diego. What's your clan? And I, my uh, grandfather, and I want to know just out of general curiosity. So. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You ask me about what my clan is? It's not a thingy. I'm a salt clan and I'm part of the mountain. So I'm at home when I go hunting, when I go fishing, except I never got acquainted with the mosquitoes. <laughs> they were always pestering me. Yes. And then, I did all. Thank you. Oh, hey, wait, the baby Hassan. Now that's a kiss. Right there. <laughs>